You're up. Yeah, my, my code quality has hopefully increased since I've started working with Precult as a partner. So uh, their code reviews, first you have to look at, first of all, the first couple of times you get them, it's kind of soul destroying. And then you remember that it's their code that they're attacking, not you. And uh, then you remember that you wrote the code, and actually they're attacking the code that you wrote. So, actually, it could get complicated. Um, so I'm Mike Jones. You'll find me online usually as I'm sick of maps. Um, and I haven't heckled anyone yet at this conference, but you are totally free to heckle me. Outrageous. That's <laughs> not. I haven't even said anything outrageous yet. That's, that you lose points for uh, for not heckling correctly. Um, so my talk is going to be on. Um, it's it's probably only twenty five percent Python and seventy five percent the stuff around Python. But I the reason I wanted to give this talk was I feel like um, some of the time we get wrapped up in our and how beautiful our code is and how sexy the framework is that we're writing, and all of these things to do with um, development itself rather than delivering stuff that people care about. So I want to talk about how you can deliver something that people care about in days rather than months and years and weeks. Um, the company I run is, is called Western Cape Labs, and we kind of split into two parts. The bottom part is how we make our money, and that's working as contractors with cool companies like Precol. Um, to build sort of smart apps for dumb phones. And the bit that doesn't make us any money, but will in the future be hold on to with all our hope, is we also build uh, what we call smart sites for busy people. So uh, e-commerce stuff for uh, people who want to support the local South African economy and makers. And um, Promo Puffin isn't launched yet, but that's a, a site for, we're, gonna, we're building for doing promo codes for um, local small businesses. Um, that's us. And this talk comes with a warning like most of my talks do. And this talk is about the way I like to do things. And um, you, I'm sure, if I asked you all for your input, would this talk would be like 100 slides long instead of the 15 or something, 18 slides it is, including a start and a finish line. Um, because generally, when everybody gets to have their opinion, things grow in complexity and there's lots of feelings that are expressed. So um, this is my way. Feel free to ignore it. Feel free to say that's not best practice. Um, so uh, it's up to you. Um, I'm going to focus. You, this might be familiar to you. Um, this is the, uh, the lean startup diagram that, that people like to show and talk about. Um, I'm going to focus today on the idea build service bit. Um, not on the measure data. But the reason I wanted to show this is because I think the reason I'm talking about delivering something in days rather than months, weeks, etc., is because if you don't get to this part, the service part, then you won't get the measure data learn new ideas part. And that's really critical for delivering stuff that people care about because you can spend years crafting a service, building a service in the most beautiful Python in the world. But if you don't get that user feedback, you don't get people using it, you don't know if you're building something that people actually care about. So that's where I'm going to focus today. And the, the place I want to start with is, is, is asking you to ask yourself whenever you do, do something, is that, that's a horrible color on this screen, sorry, um, is do you have empathy? Um, and there was a brilliant um, article that was, um, that was linked to from Hacker News about empathy. And um, it just had a whole list of questions. This stage is lopsided. If I disappear off that side, it's because I didn't, I forgot. So don't laugh at me too hard. Um, they were asking about uh, empathy and developing empathy with your user. And before you uh, develop something, they were just, there was just a list of questions. I'll read some of them out, out, out now. And it was all about understanding your users and saying, if you can't answer these questions, then you really shouldn't be starting to write code yet. Things like, what problems are you helping your user with? Why is it a problem for them? What do, you, um, what do they use to solve that problem today? Um, what do they really use to solve that problem right now, right here, right now? Um, what do they like about what they currently use? What do they not like about it? Um, what do they wish it did better? 
Why would they switch to your solution? How many of them are there? How, did, how much do they pay for what they currently have to solve their problem, etc.? Like, just loads and loads of questions that help you understand the person that you're building your software for ultimately. And um, I think so often we assume that our opinion is the most important opinion in the room. And if I want this built, then of course everybody else is going to use it. And the, the biggest example I have of this is the website that we launched uh, in December last year on the way. It's an online store that lets you buy locally crafted goods from, uh, from people who make them in the city and they, we ship them to you in 48 hours. That sounds awesome, doesn't it? Why buy like just commodity products from Woolies every time you need to buy a present for someone when you could buy something unique, handmade, local, and reasonably priced? Sounds okay? We did one sale last month, eight sales two months before that, 12 sales before that, Two, month, two sales the month before that, like I'm revealing my sales figures. And they're shameful because I didn't, I, I asked a few people, they all nodded and smiled and said, that sounds amazing. I didn't follow through with all of the questions that helped me empathize with them around why would they use, why would they switch to my solution, as in buying from my store, rather than just stop off in Woolies on their way home? And the answer is, at the moment in South Africa, they won't. They'll just carry on buying from Woolies on their way home. And so we spent six months building and developing this most beautiful, towering beauty of code that, that has one sale in September, which is destroying for me. You want the table. You want? Your products My products suck. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's probably <laughs> the good, good. And thankfully, I don't make the products on there. <laughs> so thank you for just heckling my, uh, the wonderful customers that we serve. Um, but yes, there, there's... I'm sorry, but I mean, I have personally driven to like a three-for-one thing where uh, there was a whole new place on the web for the one So we should sell onesies. The one, actually, we don't have onesies on the site. We do have these awesome, if you have children, we have these one all-in-one sleeping bag things that you stick children in, and the, the, arms, the arms zip off. We did ask them if they do adult size ones, but they haven't yet decided to do that, so we'll see. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. Uh, no, it's feedback. Um, so um, once you've got that, um, the, these are, this is a, a slightly different structure on what are normal user stories that get used in Agile. One of, um, one of my friends, Cliff, encouraged me to start writing them this way around. Um, and if you can't describe what you're building in this format, then you really shouldn't build the feature. And it's basically saying, so that I can achieve some value um, as a type of person, I can do something. And if you can't describe your, the value that somebody is going to extract from the feature that you're building, then you really should ask yourself very, very carefully, why am I building this? And what we like to do um, at Western Cave Labs is go back to old school and write them out on, on cards because it helps stop getting distracted by Google and by every other tab that wants to buy for your attention and um, just write them down on, on cards, and then we can have a discussion and put them into files and, uh, and prioritize them based on, um, uh, on what the guys from 37 Signals like to call finding your epicenter, um, which is basically about starting with the big, what you would like to build, and just cutting and cutting and cutting until it is the minimum thing it could be. And it's not minimum viable product, it's like minimum valuable product, um, so it's, it's essentially cutting away. The example they use in, in uh, Rework is a hot dog stall and talking about the fact that if it has Coke, it's, it's, a, it's a more awesome hot dog stand, but if it doesn't have hot dogs, it's not a hot dog stand. And like keep cutting back until you have your hot dog stand. And user stories are really good for that because you can literally have a face-to-face -face fight over, um, over saying, does this does this thing make it a hot dog stand, or is it a hot dog stand with Coke? You don't have to call it Coke. Um, then once you've got your empathy with your customer, you've written the, the list of things that you want to do for them. Um, we've 
we were introduced to GitFlow by the wonderful guys at Precol, and now I'm an evangelist for this way of working. Um, if you don't use this, then fine, but find something like this, because th it's having this structure, even when I'm working on my own code on one person projects now, for things that I'm doing for myself, I still use this, because the discipline of it um, is awesome. And basically it's a set of tools that build around the Git uh, <coughs> command line tool, um, but basically allow, what we do is we you init the, the Git flow system locally, um, then what we do is create an issue on GitHub which, which describes the, is related to the user story that you just saw. Then you git flow start the feature and it creates a feature branch that's called feature slash issue dash one dash start dash blog application. Um, then code away, do your normal um, uh, individual commits, everything should be atomic, it should be very small, never, put, never have a commit message that includes and. That was the instruction I was given. Um, I've seen some terrible commit messages recently. They have like 17 bullet points. You should be ashamed of yourself. Um, it's multiple commits. Um, then when you um, when you finish that, you can you publish it, which will create a, a remote branch on on GitHub if you're using GitHub, and they can connect the two together. Then converting that to a, a using the hub wrapper, it converts your git issue to a git pull request. Rather than creating a git issue for the issue and a git issue for the pull request, it just converts the issue into a pull request. It's very useful. Um, just means that you have less crap in your stuff. <laughs> That's a technical term. Um, hate to do it. Um, then, pull, then get that pull request reviewed. Even if I review my own pull requests on github.com, even when I'm doing my own stuff. Because it's amazing what you see when you see your code not in your IDE. So it's just a good habit to get into. Um, then on your local machine, you git flow feature finish, blah, blah, blah. And that merges it with develop on your machine, you git push, and it automatically closes the issue on GitHub. So this flow, it's, it's only these few commands, but it really helps you get into that focused discipline of building a story that people care about, that actually has value in your code base and has had eyes on it and it's shipped. I recommend it highly. Okay, here's some stops. Please stop starting over. When you're trying to deliver something that has value to people, please stop reinventing the wheel. I know as a developer you are learning new stuff all the time and it's awesome to reapply it. But when you have a small window with which to deliver value, Stop rewriting all the code and use the stuff that you did before and tested and works. It's, it's, it's amazing what happens. Your work rate increases and your value to your employer or yourself increases. Um, and stop being distracted. Um, there are so many shiny things on the internet. Um, I really recommend installing, I forgot what it's called now. There's this thing that you can install on your computer which tells you how much time you're spending on Facebook and all of these other places. It just emails you a report once a week and tells you how unproductive you were last week. And it, for me, I get it on a Monday morning and I'm like, it, when it tells you that you increased your productivity last week and you spent more time in Sublime and Terminal and GitHub, I'm like, yes. Last week I had stopped faffing around in Reddit or whatever and it's, it's awesome. I'm not saying stop with the curiosity, get, stop getting distracted, stop noticing stuff. I'm just saying for, this, for the point of getting stuff done that delivers value to people, sometimes you just have to stop all of the things and do it. Please. Do. Use frameworks. I chose Flask and Bootstrap. I sometimes have to use Django for work. It's wonderful. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's awesome sometimes. But for us, we chose uh, Flask and Bootstrap for UI stuff. Um, pick a data store, learn it. We use um, uh, a seven node React cluster to serve our one order per month. Yes! <laughs> that thing will never go down. It will never leave. <laughs> but do you know what? Because I use Fabric and Chef Solo, I run the whole thing on Hetzner for 80, 80 euros with my seven node cluster. So it doesn't cost me lots of money to have my awesome redundancy, and it makes me happy. Um, uh, 
we use, um, we're starting to use Readly for, um, it's a hosted like PCI store for bank and credit card data. Um, it lets you store like for $50 a month, uh, 5,000 credit cards and bank account details. And it means we can be agnostic to which payment gateway we use and ship swift between the two. Which is a good thing to do because the payment gateway industry in South Africa is a nightmare. And you may want to change as soon as you get into bed with one of them because they're terrible. Um, and zero, we back all of our accounting data off the zero as fast as possible. It has an awesome API and it means I don't ever have to worry about like finance data being uh, corrupted in my seven node React cluster um, because it's in zero as soon as possible. And so that's what we picked as a data store. Choose ones that make sense for you. And, and the reason I put Spreely and Zero up there is because data stores, don't just think of data stores as like the, in, in terms of databases. Think about what is what type of data is this and is there a good place for it. Um, make deployment really easy. Uh, we chose Fabric and Chef Solo. Um, Petrus is doing a talk in here afterwards on Salt, which looks pretty awesome, way of, de of combining those two things together in the way that we use Fabric and Chef Solo, and if I was starting today, I'd probably use Salt. Um, and you don't have to learn Ruby. <laughs> I should get a cheer of a Python conference, and I said you don't have to. Do it. I was going for the cheap ones, but. Um, and reuse as much code as you can. Um, we built on the service which I'm talking about today, which we built in days, um, we reused the code from on the way, because it's got product-related data and our account management things, and. So rather than build the thing entirely standalone, we decided to let's get some more, sweat some, some value from the investment we made from building this thing that nobody uses. Some people use, so stop being negative. Your choices on these things may differ, but my point is pick some frameworks and get to know them really well. Um, get to know their tweaks and the things that, that are annoying and that are great about them, and just really get into them. And um, the, and then what I suggest is um, make a skeleton. The last talk in this room next door was on uh, was showing through a Django skeleton um, that was really really good. Um, he's going to put it up on GitHub. I forget what the guy's name is, um, but have a look out for that because some of the things that he's built around creating repeatable J um, Django-based applications are a really good set of best practices. But do this for yourself as well, like. This is how we use Flask. Um, uh, it's, I, I've cobbled together it from a few different best practice stuff, and some of it's quite like making Flask like Django. I know somebody is gonna say that. Um, but it's simpler, and there's less folders, because folders make me sad. Um, and these, these are just a, uh, it's a really easy way to create a, a, gr a, a Flask app that can grow um, and, and be, be very modularized, but without doing all of that up front. It just, it's a nice way of doing it. There's a couple of articles around um, online about how to, to do this. But make yourself a skeleton and, and just clone that every time you start a new project rather than starting from scratch and having to remember all those things. And with GitHub, you can do a really good thing where you just create a new repo, declare a remote to be your skeleton, and then pull it in and then start working. And that just makes getting started much, much faster. Um, that's an awful slide, I'm sorry. It's better on that side. Um, the, this is, um, I recommend mixing in, um, if you're using Flask, Ginger templates, What the Forms, and Bootstrap templates. There's three sections to this. The first bit is the, is the declaration. We declare in uh, sharedforms.py, uh, a form, then we there's a macro that we reuse, which takes the standard bootstrap boilerplate for creating inline errors, etc., and then a, a render field um, snippet. Uh, my slides will be online as soon as this is finished, so you can see this in a bit more detail. Um, but using those those simple three things allow you to create repeatable, good-looking forms. Um, and just drop them into uh, drop them into your um, your app as you build it. And we have different ones that we use for different types of layouts, etc. And just getting to reuse those is really really easy. Um, 
my third and last flask tip is use, use decorators. Like, I came to pipe, I've never seen decorators till I came to pipe them. And like, David helped me, thankfully, um, to understand the awesomeness of decorators. Um, if you don't know about them, and everybody who knows about them goes, <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, if you don't know about them, you're like, wow. And it takes you, doesn't take long to go from the wow to the of course. Um, so those of you that are mocking me right now, just remember what it was like before you knew about them and, and go with me. Um, just uh, declaring these, especially in something like Flask, allows you to easily wrap around um, different, just layer them on top of functions. And like we have three different decorators, one for user login, one for admin login, and one for API login. And they both have, one uses tokens, one uses a more secure session lookup, etc. And it just allows you to really clearly continue adding a, uh, a method. And then if you, for example, want to launch a new feature, which only admins have access to, you just put that decorator on top of the root. And then when you're ready to go live, you just take it out. And those things are just really easy ways of, of iterating. That just makes Django. Does it? <laughs> Uh, no, it's somebody's, <laughs> is it not pet painted? <laughs> it's at least it's yeah. yeah I will, oh, is it? Oops. Oh yeah. Oops. Um, the other thing is um, just around look and feel. Um, I have seen so many people who have just stepped over the line with making their ugly web app pretty by using Bootstrap but then they use the black and white template and the standard font. Like, it's two minutes work to swap that out. There's some really good palette generators online which let you, give you like three complementary colors that go well together and give you the reference for them. Um, Google fonts are available for free and you just put a small snippet of code into your footer and you change, in Bootstrap there's a less, a variables dot less bar. You can change the three colors that are the primary colors. You can change the one line that declares what font you're using, and you do less C source output.css, and now you have a site that doesn't look like every other bootstrap site, because it's using a nice font. And if you have no taste, and you know you have no taste, you must have a friend that has taste. Everybody has that friend, you know, the one that looks nice. That everyone says, she's got, he's, he's got style, she's got style. Um, Ask them which font is pretty and which colors look nice together. Um, and if you're colorblind, especially as a bloke, like, ask somebody else. Um, but those couple of things really can help just change the, the impact that people have and stop people having that sort of slight, oh, this is made by a techie feeling when they look at your stuff. Um, um, Make your deploys repeatable. Um, we use Fabric, and um, we use it this way. I've seen other people use it other ways. Um, we use rsync rather than git pull, because I don't want to push all of my stuff that's in git. So I just rsync certain folders of our repository over to the servers. Um, so we have two commands, like fab staging deploy bootstrap, which will create all the folders, push rsync all of the, the chef solo templates, runs Chef and creates virtual and, and, and hip installs, etc. cetera. Um, Jonathan would be so proud of me having all of this stuff. Jonathan Hitchcock, who was, we have to weep for, we have to hold our hearts for, has gone to Facebook and uh, abandoned Cape Town and all its developer needs. He forced me to do this and made me waste a month of my life, but now I'm happy every time I do Fab Deploy um, because he forced me to. And, um, it just makes like iterating so much easier. Like you can do it. It's like TDD. I used to make. It used to find it's so depressing. Like I have to fail before I can succeed. Like it was just hurting my soul. But now I can fail. I can succeed. I can deploy it, and it's a happiness loop in like three minutes. And um, I've even synced it up to my phone. There's this app called. Uh, um, Ask me afterwards, I'll show it to you. Pushover, that's it, pushover, and it sends you a notification when you trigger a HTTP URL, and it pings me every time a deploy finishes. So I get this little moment of happiness, but my pocket vibrates and my phone goes, and, and so I recommend giving yourself those little endorphins. Every now and then. <laughs> um, 
a serious point here is that if you have these kind of triggers in place, it allows you to relax and push out your stuff more uh, in, a, in a faster, more confident way, and you're spending less time polishing that thing that nobody will ever use, because you can push it out, and if nobody uses it, or they use it and it breaks, you just tweak it, fix it, and push it again, rather than have this whole build up you have to have emotionally before you press the button that FTPs your code, or whatever your way of doing it is. And so that's what we did, was we made it live in a week, and look at that side, it's much prettier. Um, that's, that light is ruining this side. And basically, we launched a coffee subscription service that sits on top of On The Way in a week. And it was challenging, it was emotional, and um, things didn't go the way we expected, but we delivered something. And basically, now anyone in South Africa can get great coffee delivered to their door in uh, once a month for a fixed amount. And it's awesome. And if you're a business, you can select, like, I want to receive all the coffee and it will send you all the coffee, and you'll, you'll pay all the money. And um, so this is like aimed at helping us get out of that hole that we've dug ourselves. And um, I'm doing something very risky today. If you go to that second URL, otw.io pi, pi con coffee, then your first month on the coffee subscription will be free. So do not tell anybody outside of this room about that. And if you're watching online, this offer is no longer relevant. <laughs> um, uh, so um, take a note of that URL. If you sign up for our coffee subscription service before that, um, before Monday, so over either this time or the weekend, then your first month will be free. But if you all sign up, I'm losing a lot of money. But that will be great because it will validate my idea that this is worth signing up for. Because if you won't give me your bank account details in order to carry on with the awesome subscription, when you get that first box and you open it and you go, wow, my free Nomu chocolate as well, um, then, <laughs> then it's not worth me carrying on. So we will kill this thing in two months and we will go home. Because if, if I can't sell this product to you guys, as people who drink a lot of coffee usually, and are happy and comfortable with buying stuff online, then how am I going to sell it to the rest of South Africa? So that's why I'm doing this, to validate the idea. Um, so do it, and make me poor. And if you want to cancel after one month and you've had your free month, that's fine. You just have to send me an email, and we'll cancel it, and my children will starve. <laughs> um, but please, seriously, um, don't, don't, don't give this to just all of your friends, or tweet it, I'd be really appreciate that. Give them the top one. They will still get a free Nomi hot chocolate if they sign up this month. Um, so that would be awesome. And if you sign up, although we said the next shipping is September the October the second, if you sign up before Monday, we'll do an extra special PyCon shipping next week. Okay. And that is my talk. Um, the last URL I will give you is that bottom one. All of the things I have linked to. Um, are on, uh, it's a bit.ly bookmark set. So all of the links to everything that I've talked about, including my presentation, will be at that one um, link afterwards. Apart from that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I wrote the test for you. <laughs> you did. Um, it's, it's, yes, I went to, we went, so that's why you should go to the Python meetups in Cape Town, because you can get other people to write code for you for free. Um, the, actually, that's not a good reason to go. Go because of the, the friendship and the love. Your question, this, yes, we did write tests with this. Um, it was built on a platform which didn't have tests, but the new stuff that we've written, um, has had tests written for it, and yes. Um, and I think that's actually, Michael said that in his talk earlier about like fixing things that are, um, rather than trying to create projects where you rewrite all of the things when they're broken, I think like what the Yola way of, of is doing is if you open a file to fix something in that file, then clean it up and pep eight it and 
write a test or whatever for the thing that fails, and then you're, there's a less of an emotional burden of, of adding tests to things, and I think. So we've tried to do that. I'm a changed man since last year's conference. Last year, I went to, there was a session on TDD last year at PyCon, and I was like, that sounds like the most depressing thing ever. Um, and then I started working with Preykult, and they changed me. <laughs> so, yeah, it is. Preykult. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Any other questions? Yes. That's my sexy British accent helping business. It's, I wish my, it, well, I don't have the sexy British accent. I have the South London, like, where is it from, my, isn't it? Like, so, no. It just makes people question why I'm here. I come, I come here from the mountain and the sea. Could it be that your sales are affected by the fact that not everyone in South Africa has heard of On The Way until they're so, Yes, that's a good question. Um, making, so, that was my premise. That was what I was holding on to, the fact that we didn't have great awareness of the site. So we decided uh, six weeks ago to start advertising, doing some Facebook advertising, some Google keyword advertising, etc. The Facebook advertising led to our sales going eight, 12 to one. So the opposite happened. More people knew about us and less people bought. So. Um, and Google Ads in South Africa for, for targeting South Africans is really hard for the product that we're selling because most people aren't looking for what we're selling. They don't know that they can buy a, a, a handmade oak um, chopping board made in Cape Town. They just, they're not looking for that online. They, they will actually go to a real market. Um, so uh, there's, it's tough doing Google keyword advertising and the Facebook stuff was working, it seemed to be working, like we were getting click-throughs based on, um, but I think the mindset people are in when they're browsing Facebook is not the buy method, they're clicking on the things and looking at their friends' cat pictures and my beautiful baby pictures. I have four kids. Um, they're not clicking, they're clicking on my ad but they're not buying stuff, so, um, yeah, I would have agreed with you three months ago, I would say, yes, let's just spend more money on advertising. But it's tricky when you're not working with brands. We're working with individuals who don't have a brand. Their product is their brand, and they're not spending money on their brand. Um, so, yeah, it's tricky. Uh, no, sorry, that's just for short URLs. Uh, Ontheway.co.za is our main website. OTW.io is just our, we use it for short URLs and stuff. Yes, um, have I considered taking my laptop down to the market? And yes, we have, um, but a lot of those things don't scale very well. And I know it's, yeah, there's lots of talk, there's lots of advice online, like Paul Graham wrote an article, article about like, you should do stuff that won't scale, like uh, the guys from uh, Airbnb, Airbnb did. They took photos by hand of all of their stuff. But actually, when you've got four kids and a life, doing all of the things that won't scale at, the, at some point, your wife says no, and um, I have I've stood at robots handing out leaflets and done. It's so depressing. Next time somebody comes and asks to give you a leaflet in your car, just hold down the window and take it, even if you put it in the bin. Because when you roll and people, as you walk towards people, they shut the window as you're trying to put it into them. Souls destroying. Um, so there are some physical things that I definitely agree it should be good to do, but um, there's, you just have to draw a balance between life and. We're going to stick around with that until South Africa catches up with the rest of the world. What do you have against maps? What do I have against maps? There's always somebody. Um, <laughs> I don't hate maps. Maps is spam backwards. Um, it was my username. They won't let you have spam in your username on Hotmail back in 1999. So I just put it backwards. And I've been, I'm sick of maps ever since. I love maps. They're awesome. Thank you. When I started using Chef, I was using Vagrant, and Vagrant works really well with Chef Solo, and if you're not using Vagrant, you should use Vagrant, um, please. Um, it, and so I was using that, and I, try, I looked at Chef, and it 
wouldn't work, and it was confusing, and all of these things like knife and stuff, and it just, I was, I think I'd spent a month already being berated by Jonathan to do all of the things in all the right ways, and it was just a very easy way of saying, I've used Chef, <laughs> and closing that part of my life. Um, I think probably now the Chef installer is a lot better than it used to be. It was a pain, and I couldn't get it working across the network. But Chef Solo is really easy to use and really small and compact. Um, but if you're starting from scratch and you're a Python person, I do <laughs> um, <laughs> suggest using, probably looking at salt as well. Um, or at least this is what Petrus has to say about it. And, and Sybil. And Sybil, whoever Sybil is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Are we done? Cool. Enjoy. Thank you very much. And do sign up for coffee. Make me poor. I'd love to be poor because you're all signed up. <laughs>